Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidelberg, um, Stefan, for inviting me to this fantastic meeting. I'm really enjoying that and learning a lot of things. Now, it's nothing new. It's been talked about all throughout the couple of days, and especially this morning, why we should be focusing on the outer retina for retinal degeneration cases. Um, here are my declarations. Now, the standard OCT scans, it's a bit like me going out in Berlin with my iPhone and taking pictures, unlike the official photographer's camera. But it does the job for me, um, and I have the Spectralis uh, 2 in the clinic, which does the work for me. I would love to lay my hands on the high-definition OCT scanners so I can see more details. However, we have access to a fantastic tool, and I'm going to talk about the clinical application of that tool in our practice. The world has changed so much, and this is an example of an 82-year-old eye, where you can see easily everything that you need to see to make that clinical decision, make a diagnosis, and plan your treatment. It's quite obvious what is going on here, and our focus draws attention to the fluid in the retina, but what's more important is what is going on under that fluid. Now that's one case. And then you have cases like this, and again, that has been talked about in the earlier session today. You can easily see that the patient has advanced uh, drive from a macular degeneration with macular atrophy, the serora that we know of. But then, what about this case? This is a 12-year-old eye. And it looks phenotypically similar to the first case, except for the hemorrhage. And this happened to be a case with congenital uh, combined hematoma of retinal pigment epithelium and retina. And you can see they have more or less the same features if you pay attention to what is going on in the outer retina. Um, you have similar changes on top of your Brooks membrane that leads to the exudation in the retina and then leads to the formation of the scar. This was picked up by the optometrist as an opportunistic um, finding. Right, what about this case then? Um, there are no signs in the um, inner retina, but you can see that the Brooks membrane has got some changes just on top of that, and you have some something what looks like intraretinal cyst, and that's the other eye, and you find more or less the same changes. The Brooks membrane it maybe is breached, and this happened to be a case with angioid streaks. What I want to draw your attention to um, is what is going on there. And on top of that, your photoreceptors don't look very healthy in that area either. Though the patient does not have any neovascular changes going on, there is something going on already in your outer retina, something that I described to my residents as salt and pepper sign in the outer retina. So you have hyper and hyperreflectivity in your outer retinal um, areas. And as I said, this was a case with angioid streak with no other complication from that at this stage at least. Um, so why is, it, why is it important that we focus on the outer retina? Now, we know that they are interdependent. You have the important phot photoreceptors, which rely on the integrity of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. It's a very active, metabolically very active uh, tissue in the body, highest oxygen demand, and there's a lot that is going on there. Um, as Christine mentioned, our OCT scanners are like the light electron microscope, and certainly it is, so we can see the layers of the outer retina uh, in good enough definition for our clinical practices to pick up changes that we want to see. It's how we interpret those changes and relate them with what is going on uh, clinically and disease states that is more important. So um, here is an example of a case that we have been following up in our clinic for a while, and this starts back up in 2015. You can see there are a few drusen, a tiny drusen, but then there's something else going on on the other side of the fovea. 
Not very obvious, but there is some changes, salt and pepper, early changes that we can, we can see. Uh, and the next picture I'm showing you is 2022. This is last year in the same area where there was hardly any change. Now you see more of the changes taking place, some hyper-reflectivity as well as hypo-reflectivity. And the other side where we had the drusen, of course, it has started to get into the aurora already. So you can see there are changes that are obvious on our standard OCT scanners that can be picked up early enough and maybe that is something that we need to focus on when we're talking about the treatments that are going to be available for our patients so as to prevent that changes happening and progressing into the full macular atrophy. Um, in, in the same patient, if you look superior to the fovea, you're starting to see now that there is reticular serodrusin, multiple uh, reticular serodrusin, in fact, has taken place. So there may be signs, some, some biological markers in there that we can uh, learn to define and uh, progress on. And other types of drusen, we have seen examples of them. And here I'm going to share another case with uh, drusenoid pigment epithelial detachment. You see some large drusen. What happens with time is the bigger drusen then takes over the smaller drusen and becomes even bigger. And you have some fluid next to that now taking place, so that's draping fluid around your drusen. And if you follow that patient further up five years down the line, you can see there are even more drusen, drusen getting bigger in this case. And you're starting to see something really worrying sign on the other side, that you see some subretinal fluid undulating pigment epithelial detachment maybe. So we need to be focusing on these changes as we go along. And here's another example with a patient with a macular hole and drusen. And in this case, what happened was as the drusen evolved, it um, gradually disappeared. And you have the remodeling of the outer retina. But you see there is, there is, there is some realignment of um, the outer uh, retinal layers and some integrity of the ISOS junction or EZ is a little bit better. Um, this CSR has been mentioned, so I'm going to move away slightly from the age related macular degeneration and see if we can learn from the other retinal conditions that can help us understand things better using the OCT scanner. CSCR is the fourth common uh, retinal condition that we see in our clinics and usually affects the working age uh, patient group, as we know. Um, and there are patients that you see that you, they present to you with subretinal fluid, but then they tend to settle down. But then there is another group within the CSR. Um, we had a look of our patients with CSR, and at the time we thought that is the amount of fluid that would dictate how the visual function correlates with, with the patient. So we found um, some 100 plus patients with CSR on our cases. Um, notes of that, we followed up some 50 patients who had six months follow-up and found that the patients who had good visual acuity, they had less amount of subretinal fluid. But the patients who had poor visual acuity, they had a very high serous detachment. But that's only one part of the thing, the fluid, amount of the fluid. What is more important is looking at the anatomy itself in the outer retina once again. And in this case, with the chronic recurrent um, CSI, you see there are these hyperreflective dots of the foci within what is the photoreceptor layer, as well as on the surface of your Brooks membrane RP level. Um, and those changes are quite important because, as you see with the follow-up, we see the atrophy in the area where you had those hyperreflective dots. So it is not just about the fluid. There is more than the fluid that we should be focusing on. There are markers that we can pick up quite easily. And there, are, there have been theories to explain these things because the photoreceptors shed those discs and which are picked up by the pigment epithelium and regenerated. And there is a, maybe a cargo clearance problem within the pigment epithelium that leads to such changes of atrophy later on. You may have come across cases with uh, choroidal excavation. This happened to be a patient with a base disease, 
where your patient had reabsorption of that lipofuscin material. But then again, as you can see, the patient has all that elongation of the photoreceptors in, in that edge of the lesion. Superior to that, there has been complete shedding of the photoreceptor uh, elongated areas, and some of them deposit down in the excavated area. Now, it's not clear why the patient ended up with ex excavation rather than the fibrosis on top of the Brooks membrane that we see. So we have a cohort of patients with the various inherited retinal dystrophy in our clinics, and we thought it was a good area to explore to further understand some of the changes. And I'm going to share one or two examples maybe with you. Um, in cases um, that you have macular atrophy, it's been shown that the macular thickness goes down. We need to look at a wider picture, though. And this happened to be a patient with star guards, and we looked at the patient with star guts. Again, cases have been described, papers have been written, that you can look at the macular thickness as a biomarker uh, for progression of star guts. We, however, thought that it would be better to look at both the photoreceptor layer, that is the EZ line, as well as pigment epithelium. And we presented our work at uh, Uretin a few years back. And what you see is when the patient present, their visual acuity ranges from very good to very poor depending on how good their um, photoreceptor layers are. And with time, that gets worse. So you lose more photoreceptors, as well as the pigment epithelium as the time goes by in these cases. And that's what, we, that's what we suggest we should be looking at rather than just measuring the thickness in the clinic. However, from the busy clinic's point of view, it's easier to have a mathematical number that tells us which way the patient is progressing, either getting better or getting worse. But when you look, want to look at the prognostic features, it might be very useful to look at the outer retina. And here is one example of that patient with uh, Stargardt's disease. And you can see how the anatomy changes with time. So you can see there is atrophy uh, at the bottom, which is the initial baseline visit with us. But that atrophy gets worse with time. This fast expansion of loss of your photoreceptors as well as pigment epithelium. So it's been well known that both the age-related macular degeneration and inherited retinal dystrophy share some of the common structural uh, changes because they both have a common pathway um, that ends up with the same or similar kind of pheno phenotypes when you look at the OCT scans. And here is a little cartoon depicting that change, saying that when you have a health, you have a healthy um, retina because you have healthy pigment epithelium supporting your photoreceptors because the Brooks membrane is not thickened. With time, though, there is thickening of your Brooks membrane that leads to poor transfusion of your nutrients to the, to the near retinal pigment epithelium as well as photoreceptors. And hence, you lose some of the new, um, retinal pigment epithelium, as well as some of the photoreceptors in both the condition, age-related macular degeneration, as well as retinal dystrophies. Uh, I know I'm generalizing that, but I'm, I'm going to leave you with this, another example of an inherited retinal dystrophy. You can see that this patient at presentation has something that has been plastered on top of your Brooks membrane. There are multiple drusen. There's a basal laminar deposit. This is at baseline. And if we follow the patient through over the years, you see how it changes. So this is at year one. Again, you see the changes in the outer retina. My salt and pepper um, hypo and hyperreflective hyper dots in that area with atrophy of photoreceptors. If you follow it through as you go along, you see that it becomes a very obvious atrophy. And that progresses with time, um, and you lose almost all of the foveal photoreceptors. And this happened to the patient with a Sorsby's fundal dystrophy, where you have the basal lamellar deposit, very thick layer there, that gradually gets absorbed with atrophy of overlying photoreceptors. 
So I, I call those hyperreflective foci my friend Sid. That helps me to focus that for those hyperreflective spots probably represent some of the distressed tissues. And I was interested to hear uh, Dr. Sada use that phrase, distressed, uh, in his talk this morning. So maybe with high definition uh, scans, some of those hyperreflective foci may be further defined whether they actually represent such type of change in, in biological tissues. Um, and yes, we can see better. We have seen fantastic scans. So I'm just going to leave you with my conclusion that even with the standard OCT scanners that we have in our busy clinics, it provides very good um, information for our patients, especially if we focus on those layers in the outer retina. Thank you.